Welcome to the Pediatric Review, where I help you prepare for your pediatric nursing exams. If you would like a copy of the study guide, you can find it on my website, blossomwithjessica.com. So now we're going to talk about pediatrics, and the first thing we're going to discuss is growth and development. So as a child grows and develops, there are certain milestones that are set for them as far as psychosocial, biological, cognitive, nutritional needs, things like that. So we're going to go through each one. So the first is infant. This is birth till one year of age. Psychosocially, this is when they're going to be learning about trust versus mistrust. And we can remember this because the child is focused on getting their needs met. If they're hungry, they're going to cry. If they are dirty, they're going to cry. And if their caretaker comes to them and changes them and feeds them and nurtures them, they're going to learn to have a sense of trust. However, if those things don't happen, they're going to have mistrust because they can't rely on others to care for them. Biologically, their weight is going to double at six months of age and then triple at a year. Their length will be 2.5 centimeters per month until six months, and at one year, their length increases by 50%. Their fontanelles, the posterior, closes at 6 to 8 weeks and the anterior at 12 to 18 months. Vision can focus at 4 weeks. Fine motor skills will be grasping. And gross motor, they will have some head control, be sitting and crawling. Cognitively, They'll have sensory motor functions. They'll use reflexes and move voluntarily using senses to interact with the environment. They'll have reflexive behaviors, simple and repetitive behaviors, and we'll go through reflexes later. They'll have repetitive movements, imitation behaviors, and object permanence. This is important. This is acquiring memory happens at six to eight months. So object permanence is knowing that something is there even if you can't see it. So if you show the child a block and then you put the block behind a couch or something, the child will look around the couch or the chair to try to see and find that block. They'll realize it's there. It's the same thing when you cover your face. That's why young kids like peekaboo because you hide your face and then you're there and they're excited because they don't have that object permanence yet. But then as they get older, they know that your face is going to be behind the hands. Nutritionally, they have to have milk for the first six months, solids at six months. This includes iron fortified cereals, rice, barley, oatmeal, and multigrain. We want to make sure they get 400 IU vitamin D to prevent rickets. Usually that's why the cereal is fortified. It will have that in it. We want to introduce vegetables and fruits one at a time and do not give them honey till one year because this can cause botulism in children. So that's important. Injuries we need to watch for. So choking is a big one. If you get any questions about like, feeding a child foods, if there are things that they can choke on like blueberries, candy, grapes, anything that can get stuck in their throat, that is not going to be the correct answer for a child under one because we're worried about choking, motor vehicle accidents, drowning, suffocation, and sleeping while they're sleeping. Nursing interventions, we want to encourage parents to hold the child and remain with the patient, provide opportunities for non-nutritive sucking like pacifiers, things like that. Provide the patient with toys for comfort and stimulation. So this is if they're in the hospital. These are nursing interventions that we can do with them. All right, so let's talk about toddlerhood. So this is going to be years one through three. Psychosocially, they're looking for the milestone of autonomy versus shame and doubt. We want to give them autonomy. We want to let them explore, gain confidence, have confidence in themselves. We don't want to put them down or tell them you can't do that. Don't do this. We want to allow for their growth. It helps to differentiate their the self from others. That's what they're, they're learning to control bodily functions, such as using the restroom and things like that. They're increasing their communication and they do have some negativism. So they'll say no, they'll be defiant. That's why we hear the terrible twos. That is normal. Biologically, their growth is slowing. 
Their birth weight has quadrupled by 2.5 per year. Their weight has quadrupled by 2.5 years. Their height is 7.5 centimeters per year. Vision 2040 is acceptable. Their fine motor skills have improved. They have manual dexterity at 12 to 15 months. They can throw a ball at 18 months. Their gross motor skills include walking at 12 months, running at 18 months, walking up the stairs at two years, and jumping at 2.5 years. Cognitively, they'll start to have the pre-oppositional years are two to seven years old, and the pre-conceptual subphase is two to four years old. They'll have symbolic thoughts, and they can perform mental operations, they're egocentric and intuitive. Language, they'll have four words at one years old, but by two years old, they'll have 300 words, and by three, they'll have simple sentences. Toilet training, they start to have sphincter control at 18 to 24 months. We wanna ensure motor readiness, able to undo their button or zipper, things like that. Injuries, we're worried about our falls, choking, playing with electrical outlets. And nursing interventions, while they are to maintain toilet training procedure while they're in the hospital, encourage independent behaviors, provide rewards for good behaviors, and give choices, and be assertive. So when it comes to the preschooler, this is the three to five years old, psychosocially, the developmental stage is called initiative versus guilt. This is the patient wants to be independent and be praised. This helps to develop their conscious based on their parents' reactions, so rewards or punishments. And during this time, they do have magical thinking. So if you get any questions about magical thinking, that's going to be the preschooler. Biologically, their growth stabilizes. They start to gain two to three kilograms a year and nine six to nine centimeters a year. Gross motor is that they can skip and hop on one foot at four, skip on alternative feet, jump rope, swim and skate at five. Gross to fine motor function includes able to ride a tricycle or bicycle, jumping or skipping, catching a ball more consistently and refined drawing. Cognitively, they have the pre-operational that is two to seven years. An intuitive phase is four to seven years. This is, they'll have more reasoning, but not logical. They'll have centration, so focus on one aspect of a situation. Time is abstract, magical thinking, and social awareness. Nutritionally, they need 90 calories per kilogram and 100 milliliters per kilogram of fluid. Play is more social, so we have to be careful because this is a time where there is a chance for abduction. They don't understand stranger danger. Stutter is normal for less than six months. Speech delay is not normal. So injuries we want to watch for are drowning and motor vehicle accidents, such as running on the street. And nursing interventions for this age in the hospital are to encourage the patient's improvement in care of the patient. So allow them to be encourage the parent to be involved give clear explanations to relieve fear, use toys, ensure the patient knows they didn't cause the sickness on themselves or their siblings. So the school age child is 6 to 12. Psychosocially, this is when they're in the milestone of industry versus inferiority. Patient wants to gain new skills and knowledge to feel confident. Competition is good. They're growing their sense of independence, but peer approval is a strong motivator. Biologically, weight gain is slower, four to seven pounds a year, and height is about five centimeters a year. Loss of temporary teeth, dental health is important, permanent teeth are now coming in. Cognitively, they are in the concrete oppositional stage from seven to 11 years. Conservation and decentralization, so understanding multiple perspectives and part of the problem. They know right from wrong by understanding standards of acceptable behavior. And we can use a numeretical pain scale after the age of seven. 
social development. So they can have peer pressure. This can be positive or negative. They have increased stress due to extracurricular activities, social media, and cyberbullying. They have efficient language skills, so the nurse can use detailed explanations. Injuries include sporting injuries such as concussions, head injuries if they're not wearing a helmet, and risk-taking. Our nursing interventions for when they're in the hospital are to provide privacy, explain treatments clearly, and encourage continuation of schoolwork. And for the adolescent, so psychosocially, they're in the identity versus confusion. They're developing a sense of self and personal identity. They're developing autonomy, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral. Peer support is very important, and they're finding their sexual identity. Biologically, they have predictable sexual maturation and physical growth, but highly variable growth spurts begin early in girls. Cognitively, they're in the formal operational. They have abstract thinking, so they can think of past experiences and future consequences, formal logic and decision-making. They're also egocentric, so they can look deeper into themselves and see what they desire and how they'd like to achieve it. Socially, their family and parent relationships, peer groups, romantic relationships, social environment, mental health, eating disorder, ADHD, anger, and suicide. And our nursing interventions for this age group include privacy and confidentiality, quiet and non-threatening environment, and encourage participation in making treatment decisions. So let's talk about developmental skills. So at age three, the gross motor function should be walking upstairs with alternate feet, tricycle riding, and jumping forward. Fine motor functions include drawing circles, feeding self, and gripping crayons. Language, three to four word sentences, asks why questions, and can say own age. And social is associatively play and toilet training. By age four, Gross motor includes walking downstairs with alternate feet, balancing on one foot, and catching a ball. Fine motor is drawing squares, cutting with scissors, and tying knots. Language includes names two or more colors and tells stories. And socially, imaginative and group play and focused on self. By age five, they should be able to skip, walk backwards, and jump rope. Fine motor includes drawing triangles, tying shoelaces, and printing letters and numbers. Language includes counting to 10, full sentences, nose days of the week. Okay, so let's talk about integumentary disorders. So the first one is eczema. This is an inflammation of the epidermis associated with a family history of the disorder. Signs and symptoms include red and scaliness on the skin, papules and vesicles that are oozing and crusting. Our nursing interventions include avoiding exposure to skin and irritants or excessive bathing. Intermittently apply cold and wet compresses to soothe. Administer antihistamines, topical steroids or antibiotics. Prevent scratching and keep clean and instruct the patient to wash clothes with a mild detergent and take measures to prevent infection. Then we have impetigo. So this is a bacterial infection of the skin due to poor hygiene or infected bite or rash. It mostly occurs during hot, humid months. It will appear most commonly on the face and mouth, neck and extremities. Signs and symptoms include vesicle or pustule, that progresses to an exudative lesion with honey-colored crusts. They'll have burning and pruritus. Our nursing interventions include contact precautions. It's highly contagious. Keeping lesions open to the air and let it dry out. Daily bathing. Warm saline compress to lesions two to three times a day. Topical and oral antibiotics. Proper hand hygiene. And using separate towels or linens for patients. So lice. Signs and symptoms are scratching scalp, and you'll see little white nits in the hair. Our nursing interventions are using a medication that is going to kill the lice, extra fine tooth comb to remove them, so you'll comb through the hair to get them out, and then the comb is either discarded or soaked in boiling water for 10 minutes, 
You change and clean clothes in linen daily in hot water and in a hot dryer for at least 20 minutes. No sharing of clothes, hats, or brushes, and siblings may also need to be treated. Then we have scabies. So this is a parasitic skin infection, a skin disorder caused by an infection. The incubation period is the female mite burrows into the epidermis, lays eggs, and dies after a month. The infectious period is during the entire course of the infestation. Signs and symptoms are a puritic papular rash and burrows into the skin, so a fine grayish red line that may be difficult to see. Nursing interventions are we're using a topical application of a medication that is going to kill the scabies. We use a Lindane shampoo. When using the Permeth, this is the medication, it is applied to a cool, dry skin at least 30 minutes after bathing, and it is applied all over the skin, not just to the areas of the rash. And we want to leave on the skin for 8 to 14 hours. Clothing, bedding, pillowcases need to be changed daily, washed in hot water, and dried and ironed before reusing. This process must be completed for a week. Non-washable toys should be placed in a sealed plastic bag for at least four days. So now let's talk about burns in children. So burns in very young children have a high mortality rate. Children burns are often worse because their skin is thinner. And any burn covering 10% or more of a total body surface will require fluid resuscitation Children do not use the rule of nines as their body proportions are different. So our nursing considerations, if it is a major burn, we are first assessing for airway breathing circulation. Then we begin resuscitation measures if necessary. So assess adequacy of fluid resuscitation, vital signs, especially heart rate, urine output, adequacy of capillary refill, and their sensory status. Fluid replacement is needed during the initial 24-hour period after a burn, and crystalloid solutions are used during the initial phase of therapy. Removed burned clothes and jewelry, cover wounds with a clean cloth, and keep the child warm. Okay, let's talk about hematologic disorders. So the first thing we're going to talk about is sickle cell crisis. So sickled blood cell is the shape of the blood cell. Instead of being a circle like normal, it is sickle shaped, a half moon. So these red blood cells cannot carry oxygen and they clump together due to inadequate oxygen or hydration causing vascular occlusion and this can be very painful. So signs and symptoms include vascular occlusion crisis, so stasis of blood, clumping of cells, ischemia and infarction, you can see fever, painful swelling of hands, feet, and feet and joints, abdominal pain. They can have splenic sequestration, so pooling and clumping of the blood in the spleen. This will show signs of profound anemia, hypovolemia, and shock. They can have hyperhematolytic crisis, so accelerated rate of red blood cell destruction. This can look like anemia, jaundice, and reticulosis, reticulocytosis. They can have aplastic crisis, so diminished production and increased destruction of red blood cells triggered by a viral infection or depletion of folic acid, which leads to anemia and pallor. Our nursing interventions include hydration and adequate blood flow, oral or IV fluids. They may also need electrolyte replacement. They may need supplemental oxygen and blood transfusions. We should promote a position that keeps limbs extended and elevate the head of the bed no more than 30 degrees, avoid pulling, straining, or painful joints. We want to monitor for anemia, decrease perfusion and shock. We want to educate patients on the importance of vaccines and the hereditary aspects of the disease. We do not administer meperidine for pain because of the risk of normepridine induced seizures. Then we have iron deficiency anemia. So this is so this is low iron means a low supply of hemoglobin. Signs and symptoms are pale, weakness, fatigue, low hemoglobin and hematocrit, and microcytic and hypochromic red blood cells. Nursing interventions are to increase oral iron intake with iron supplements given between meals with fruit juice for maximum absorption. 
IM injections of iron using the Z-Track method or IV administration of iron. Teach patients about expected dark stool color and constipation when taking iron supplements. And liquid iron preparation stains the teeth, so we should teach clients to drink with a straw and brush teeth right after. Then we have aplastic anemia. So this is a deficiency of circulating erythrocytes in all other formed elements of the blood due to arrested development in the bone marrow. Signs and symptoms are pancytopenia, which is deficiency of erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes, petechiae, purpura, bleeding, pallor, weakness, and fatigue, and tachycardia. Our nursing interventions are to prepare the child for a bone marrow transplant, immunosuppressive medications, colony stimulating factors to enhance bone marrow production, they may need a blood transfusion. Then we have hemophilia. This is a blood disorder, X-linked recessive disorder, bleeding due to a deficiency in the coagulation protective hemophilia A due to deficiency in factor eight and hemophilia B due to deficiency in factor nine. Signs and symptoms are abnormal bleeding, epistaxis, joint bleeding, easily bruising, and usually platelet function tests are normal, clotting factor functions may be abnormal. Nursing interventions, monitor for bleeding and maintain bleeding precautions, prepare to administer factor VI concentrations, DAVP, synthetic form of vasopressin, which increases plasma factor eight. Monitor urine for hematuria, assess neurostatus because they can bleed in, bleed in the brain as well. Monitor joint bleeding, control with immune immobilization, elevation, and apply ice and pressure, and avoid contact sports. Then we have von Willebrand disease. So this is another hereditary bleeding disorder due to a deficiency of or defect in protein termed non Willebrand factor. It leads to platelets adhering to damaged endothelium. Signs are epistaxis, bleeding gums, easily bruising, and excessive menstrual bleeding. A child with a bleeding disorder needs to wear a medical alert bracelet. That's our kind of big nursing intervention for that. Then we have B, thalassemia major. So this is an autosomal recessive disorder characterized by reduced production of one of the globulin change in, chains in the synthesis of hemoglobin, usually people of Mediterranean descent. There are a couple different types, so we have thalassemia minor. This is an asymptomatic silent carrier case. Thalassemia trait, so produces mild microcytic anemia. Thalassemia intermedia, this is manifested as splenomagdaly and moderate to severe anemia. And thalassemia major leads to severe anemia, called Cooley's anemia, and requires a transfusion to support and sustain life. Signs and symptoms are frontal bossing, maxillary prominence, wide set eyes with a flattened nose, green yellow skin tone, severe anemia, microcytic hypochromic red blood cells, and hepatosplenomegaly. Nursing interventions include administering blood transfusions, monitoring for iron overload, the patient may need a splenectomy, educate the patient and family on the importance of vaccines and provide genetic counseling to patients. So let's talk about pediatric oncological disorders. So the first one is leukemia. This is a malignant increase in leukocytes at an immature stage in the bone marrow, leading to bone marrow suppression. Signs and symptoms are anemia due to decreased erythrocytes, infection from neutropenia, we'll see a fever, bleeding from decreased platelet production, so we'll see petechiae, pallor, fatigue, anorexia, bone and joint pain, hepatosplenomegaly, and lymphopathy, decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit. They can show signs of cranial nerve seven or cranial nerve involvement or spinal nerve involvement, and they can have signs of intracranial pressure. So our nursing interventions are bleeding can be controlled with a platelet transfusion or packed red blood cells. Small meals that require little chewing is best for non, not irritating oral mucosa. Par parenteal or anterior feedings may be needed. 
if they can't eat because of the inflamed oral mucosa. And if a patient is receiving chemotherapy, we want to monitor for severe bone marrow suppression, infection, bleeding. We want to make sure to protect them from infections, monitor for nausea, vomiting, monitoring their bowels. They may need antiemetics or stool softeners. Monitor for hemorrhagic cystitis, peripheral neuropathy, oral membranes for mucositis. And we want to educate on hair loss and that will, hair will grow back in three to six months. And we want to monitor them closely for infection as this is a major cause of death in immunosuppressed children. Hodgkin's disease, a type of lymphoma, malignancy of the lymph nodes. It's characterized by the presence of Reed-Sternberg cells. Signs and symptoms include painless enlarged lymph nodes, enlarged firm non-tender movable nodes in the supraventricular area, abdominal pain, weight loss, intermittent low-grade fever, night sweats, and paritis. Nursing interventions include treatment without mediastinal node involvement if radiation of the involved lymph nodes, if more extensive, both radiation and chemotherapy are used. Monitor for medication-induced pancytopenia and depression of all cellular blood components. Monitor for nausea and vomiting and administer antiemetics. Encourage fluids and food. Provide small, frequent meals and monitor for weight loss. Mucosa Mucosal ulcerations provide soothing oral hygiene and prescribe mouth rinses and topical anesthetics for diarrhea. Administer antispasmodics and antidiarrheal preparations as prescribed. Introduce the idea of a wig or head wrap to the child. Provide scalp hygiene, head covering in cold weather. Wash skin daily with mild soap. Do not remove skin markings for radiation. So where they do the radiation, they're actually going to mark it so they can hit that spot every time. So you want to make sure not to remove that. Avoid sun exposure. Monitor for hematuria. And avoid suppositories, enema, and rectal temps. Institute neutropenic and bleeding precautions. So let's talk about nephroblastoma or Wilms tumor. This this is the most common intra-abdominal and kidney tumor in children. It has a poor prognosis and is very invasive. Signs and symptoms are firm, non-tender, irregular mass in the abdomen that crosses the midline. Lymph adenopathy in the cervical and subclavicular area, pallor, weakness, weight loss, anorexia, irritability, signs of respiratory or neurological impairment, partial paralysis from spinal cord compression. We also want to avoid palpation of the abdomen in child's, children with a Wilms tumor and be cautious when bathing, moving, or handling because we must keep the tumor intact. If it ruptures, it can cause the cancer cells to spread throughout the abdomen, lymph, and bloodstream. The patient will most likely need surgery, pre-op monitoring for signs and symptoms related to the tumor location, post-op monitoring for surgical complications due to organ infected, monitor complications of radiation and chemotherapy, and provide support to the child and their family. Then we have a neuroblastoma. This is a tumor that forms in the adrenal glands or sympathetic chain usually occurs before 10 years old. The presenting signs are caused by tumor compression at nearby organs. Nursing interventions are surgery to remove as much of the tumor as possible. Then they'll use radiation and chemotherapy. Post-op, we monitor for complications related to the location or organ of the surgery. Then we have osteocarcinoma. So this is the most common bone cancer in children found in the physis of the long bone, especially in the lower extremities, and the age of onset is 10 to 25. Signs and symptoms include pain at the effective site, usually the lower extremity relieved by a flex position. They may have a palpable mass, be limping, limited range of motion, and pathological fractures at the tumor site. Our nursing interventions are emotional support for the child and family communicate honestly, prepare for surgery, resection, or amputation of the limb and chemotherapy, and educate the family and patient on phantom limb pain that may occur after amputation. 
Then we have a brain tumor. This is an, an infratentorial tumor. It's usually located in the posterior third of the brain. A supratentorial tumor is located within the anterior two-thirds of the brain, mainly the cerebrum. Symptoms depend on the location, but we can see headache that worsens on awakening and improves during the day, vomiting that's unrelated to eating, ataxia, seizures, behavioral changes, clumsiness, difficulty walking, dipiplopia, and facial weakness. Nursing interventions are to monitor for signs of intracranial pressure with a brain tumor and after a craniotomy. We want to pre-op, have a neuro assessment every four hours and institute seizure precautions, assess weight loss and nutritional status, shave the child's head as prescribed, and educate the child and family on head dressings. Post-op, we want to do a neuro assessment, monitoring temps closely, monitoring signs of meningitis, which are Koenig's and Bradinsky's sign, as well as an tonus. Monitor for hemorrhage and pupillary response. Monitor for colorless drainage from the dressing ears or nose. This would be cerebral spinal fluid, which we don't want. Monitor IV fluid and use measures to prevent vomiting because that increases intracranial pressure and quiet environment. If you Okay, now let's talk about metabolic and endocrine disorders in pediatric patients. So the first is a fever. This is a body temperature above 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Signs and symptoms are flushed skin, warm to touch, diaphoresis, chills, restless, and lethargy. Our nursing interventions are to monitor vital signs, remove excessive clothing and blankets, and we want to reduce the room temperature, use cooling measures like a cool compress on the forehead. We can administer a, fun, a sponge bath with a slightly cool water for 20 to 30 minutes and then recheck the temperature 30 minutes after the bath. Administer antipyretics like Tylenol, recheck the temperature 30 minutes later, and monitor for dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. It's important to note that do not give children aspirin because of the risk of RISE syndrome or RAISE syndrome, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Then we have dehydration. This is a fluid volume deficit caused by decreased fluid intake, diaphoresis, vomiting, diarrhea, diabetic ketoacidosis, or injuries. You may not see any signs in mild dehydration, but when it gets further than that, things you will see in children are weight loss, tachycardia, tachypenia, hyperpenia, orthostatic hypotension, irritability or lethargic, slight to intense thirst, their mucous membranes can be dry or parched, sunken eyes, decreased tears, external jugular veins not visible when supine, slow capped refill, and algeria or anuria. Nursing interventions are to treat and eliminate the cause of dehydration, monitor vitals, weight, INOs, level of consciousness, skin tuger, and mucous membranes, and provide rehydration solutions through PO or IV as ordered. We want to remember that children and infants are more vulnerable to dehydration due to more of their body is water in the extracellular fluid compartment. Then we have phenylketouria. This is a genetic disorder that results in the central nervous system damage from toxic levels of phenylalanine. This is a type of amino acid. The levels reach 20 where the normal is 0 to 2. Signs and symptoms are digestive problems and vomiting, seizures and hypertonia, musty odor in their urine, mental retardation or hyperactive behavior, eczema. They have hypopigmentation, so very light hair, skin, irises. Nursing interventions are to screen newborns on the day they're born and 14 days later if the original screen was done before 48 hours of age. If they're diagnosed, we have to restrict phenylalanine intake, which is found in high-protein foods such as meat and dairy and aspartame products, and monitor physical, neurological, and intellectual development. Then we have diabetes. So there are two types of diabetes. We have type 1 
This is what people are born with. It's a destruction of pancreatic beta cells, which produce insulin. So there is an absolute insulin deficiency, meaning there's no insulin. Then we have type two. This is an insulin resistance. So the body fails to use the insulin property properly. There is a relative but not absolute insulin deficiency. So it's lower, but it's not completely gone. Insulin deficiency leads to hyperglycemia, which leads to ketoacidosis and even death. Signs and symptoms of hyperglycemia, so when sugar is too high in the blood, typically over 200, you're going to have polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, weight loss or dehydration, headache, fatigue, lethargy, or changes in the level of consciousness, blurred vision, fruity odor to the breath, slow wound healing, failure to grow at a normal rate or delayed maturation, recurrent infections, neuropathy, and cardiovascular, retinal, microvascular, or renal microvascular disease. Then we have something called diabetic ketoacidosis. So this is when the blood sugar gets above 300. A hyperglycemia progresses to metabolic acidosis. This is life-threatening. And a key term to look for is Kuzmal's respiration. So this is that fruity breath. This is a key sign that it's diabetic ketoacidosis. Then we have hypoglycemia. So the blood sugar is low. It's less than 70. This results from too much insulin, not enough food, or increased activity. You'll see headache, nausea, lethargy, confusion or anxiety, slurred speech, tremors or tingling around the mouth, hunger, and sweats. Our nursing interventions include making sure that the diabetic diet is a normal healthy diet with three meals a day eaten at regular intervals bowls with a mid-afternoon and nighttime snack, a consistent intake of proteins, fats, and carbs with each meal. We want to instruct children and parents to carry a source of glucose. These can be tablets or candy, and that's in case there is hypoglycemia, that they can give them that sugar to help raise their blood sugar levels. We want to remind them that with exercise, extra food is needed and they should be having 10 to 15 grams of carbohydrates for every 30 to 45 minutes of activity. We want to remember that diluted insulin may be required for some infants. Hemoglobin A1C should be performed every three months and a normal is less than six. Illness, infection, and stress will increase the need of insulin. If a child is NPO, insulin may need to be withheld. Blood glucose monitoring requires the child to prick themselves daily. Instruct parents and children about how to conduct glucose testing. Urine testing can show the presence of ketones and indicate impending ketoacidosis. For urine testing, the second voided urine specimen is the most accurate. Foods to treat hypoglycemia include half a cup of orange juice, eight ounces of milk, three to four hard candies, or two to three glucose tabs. And for diabetic ketoacidosis, IV fluids and insulin, monitoring vital signs, INOs, blood sugars, and potassium are our interventions. So let's talk about pediatric gastrointestinal disorders. So the first we have vomiting. The main things for this is it can lead to dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, metabolic alkalosis, aspiration, and pneumonia. Projectile vomiting can be a sign of pyloric stenosis or increased intracranial pressure. Our nursing interventions are always our ABCs, so maintain a patent airway, position the child on on their side to prevent aspiration, monitor the amount, frequency, and characteristics of the vomit, their intake and output, and any signs of dehydration, oral hydration or IV hydration, antiemetics, assess for abdominal pain or diarrhea. Then we have diarrhea. So this is important because it can lead to dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, and metabolic acidosis. So take note, diarrhea is acidosis. And we remember that vomiting is metabolic alkalosis. Nursing interventions, we're looking at the characteristics of the stool, presence of pain, signs of dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, or that metabolic acidosis, monitor for skin integrity, strict INOs, 
and severe cases, the patient may need to be NPO with fluid IV hydrate. Then we have constipation, and our nursing interventions for this are high fiber and fluid intake. They may also need an enema, stool softener, or a laxative as needed. Then we have a cleft lip palate or palate. This is a congenital abnormality due to the failure of the soft tissue or bone to fuse. Cleft lip repair happens at three to six months, and cleft palate repair is at six to 24 months. This can lead to speech impairment and otitis media. Our nursing interventions are to assess the ability to suck, swallow, and breathe, monitor fluid intake, calorie intake, and daily weights, hold the infant upright and direct milk to the side and back of the mouth when feeding, provide feeds in small amounts and burp frequently, suction equipment and bulb syringe at the bedside, and teach the patient ER feeding, so enlarged nipple, stimulate sucking reflex, swallow, and rest. Post-op, after a cleft lip repair, we want to provide lip protection, avoid positioning the child on the side of the repair or in a prone position, keep the surgical site clean and dry, and apply antibiotic ointment, monitor for signs of an infection. Post-op, for a cleft palate repair, we resume feedings, oral packing may be secured to the palate, we usually remove this in two to three days, do not allow the child to brush their teeth, Soft elbow or jacket restraints may be needed, but they have to be removed every two hours. And do not place objects like a tongue depressor or a thermometer in the patient's mouth and provide analgesics for pain. Now we're going to talk about esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula. So these are congenital defects. The esophagus terminates before it reaches the stomach. This causes foods and fluid to enter the lungs or air enters the stomach. Signs and symptoms are the three C's, so coughing, choking, and cyanosis. They'll have frothy saliva, vomiting, abdominal distension, and regurgitation, and respiratory distress during and after feeding. Pre-op, they'll be NPO, have IV fluids, suction as needed, and supine upright position. Post-op, we maintain lines, tubes, and IV, and administer oral oral feedings with sterile water, and frequent small meals. Then we have GERD. So this is the backflow of gastric contents into the esophagus. Most infants with mild GERD will improve in a year. Signs and symptoms are passive regurgitation or emesis, poor weight gain, irritability, hemotemesis or heartburn, and anemia. Nursing interventions are to assess breath sounds before and after feedings in relationship of vomiting and feedings or activity, assess for signs of aspiration, place suction equipment at bedside, monitor for signs of dehydration, intake and output, monitor IV fluids if prescribed, place infant in supine position for sleep, prone position when awake and being monitored, provide small frequent feedings, formula may be thickened with rice cereal, we can cross cut the nipple, Burp the infant frequently and handle minimally after feedings. And for toddlers, feed solid foods first, then liquids. Complications of GERD include esophagitis, esophageal strictures, aspiration of gastric contents, and aspiration pneumonia. Then we have lactose intolerance. So this is the inability to tolerate lactose due to a deficiency of the lactase enzyme. Signs and symptoms when milk is ingested, they'll have abdominal distension, cramps or colic, diarrhea, and gas. And our nursing interventions are to eliminate dairy products or administer an enzyme replacement. And they can develop a vitamin D or calcium deficiency, so we should provide a supplement and teach parents. Then we have hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So this is a narrowing of the pyloric canal between the stomach and duodendum. Signs and symptoms are projectile vomiting, hunger, irritability, peristalsic waves that are visible from left to right during feedings. So I'm underlining the ones that are important. An olive-shaped mass in the epigastrum just right of the umbilicus. And metabolic alkalosis, electrolyte imbalance, and dehydration. So our eyes and O's are to... So our nursing interventions are to monitor eyes and nose, vomiting, episodes, stools, weights, dehydration, and electrolyte imbalance. They may have a 
pylor autonomy, which is an incision of the fibers of the pylorus. And pre-op, we monitor hydration, weights, INO, urine specificity, number and characteristics of stool, correct fluid and electrolyte imbalance, and they may be NPO. And post-op, we're going to monitor INOs, surgical wounds, and for abdominal distension, small frequent feedings, and gradually increasing and burp, burping frequently. Then we have celiac disease. So this is an intolerance to gluten, which is found in wheat, barley, rye, and oats. Onset is usually one to five years old, and it occurs three to six months after the introduction of gluten. We'll see diarrhea, vomiting, stetoria, anorexia, abdominal pain and distension, muscle wasting, particularly in the buttocks and extremities, anemia, irritability. We can also have a celiac crisis, so this occurs due to the consumption of gluten. They'll have vomiting and diarrhea, rapid dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, and severe acidosis. Nursing interventions, they should be on a gluten-free diet. Educate on lifelong elimination of gluten foods, vitamin and mineral supplements. Next, we have appendicitis. So this is inflammation of the appendix. Perforation may occur in a matter of hours. Signs and symptoms are pain in the periambicular area that radiate, radiates to the right lower quadrant. That's a key sign. Abdominal pain is most intense at McBarry's point. So if you see something with McBarry's point, think appendicitis. And re referred pain indicating the presence of peritoneal irritation. Rebound tenderness and abdominal rigidity, elevated white blood cells, sideline position with abdominal guarding to relieve pain, difficulty walking and pain in the right hip, low-grade fever, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Then they can have peritonitis, which results from a peripherated appendix that you'll see increased fever, abdominal distension, tachycardia, tachypnea, pallor, chills, restlessness, or irritability. It's important to note that signs of a peripherated appendix, sudden relief of pain, and then an increase in pain with right abdominal guarding. Hirschsprung's disease. This is a congenital abnormality with the absence of ganglung cells in the rectum mechanical obstruction from low motility, signs and symptoms are no meuconium when they're born, refusing to suck, abdominal distension, delayed growth, vomiting, constipation, ribbon-like foul-smelling stools. This is a key sign. Nursing interventions, we want to monitor for enterocolitis, so this will be fever, GI bleeding, diarrhea. We want to give them a low fiber, high cal, high protein diet with stool softeners and they may need rectal irrigations. Pre-op, they'll be NPO, we'll monitor weights, assess bowel function, fluid balance, IV fluids may be needed, antibiotics and colon irrigation, strict INOs, measure abdominal girth daily, and do not take rectal temperatures. Post-op will take vital signs with still no rectal temperatures, assess surgical site for redness, assess abdominal girth, assess stoma if present, assess anal area for stool, redness, or discharge, NPO status until bowel sounds return, and the NG tube to allow intermittent suction, IV fluids, intake and output, and daily weights. Then we have interception. This is telescoping of one portion of the bowels into another. Signs and symptoms are abdominal pain, knees to abdomen, vomiting up bile-stained emesis, current-like jelly stools. That is a key sign if you see that in a question. Distended abdomen with sausage-shaped mass in right upper quadrant. Nursing interventions are to monitor for perforation, which will be fever, tachycardia, respiratory distress, and changes in level of consciousness. We give antibiotics, IV fluids, and an NG tube for decompression. If passage of normal brown stool occurs, interception has resolved and prepare for hydrostatic reduction as prescribed. So pressure from air or fluid is used to exert pressure on the area involved, helping to resolve the prolapse. Then we have abdominal wall defects. So we have a few different types. types. So one is called Filocele, so this is a herniation of abdominal contents through the umbilicus ring covered by a translucent sac. Nursing interventions include immediately 
after birth, it's covered with a sterile gauze soaked in normal saline to prevent drying. Then wrapped with a layer of plastic wrap, we monitor vital signs every two to four hours, pre-op their NPO, IV fluids, and monitor for signs of infection. And post-op, we want to control pain, monitor infection or electrolyte imbalance, and ensure adequate nutrition. Then we have a gastro... This is a herniation of the intestines. It's lateral to the umbilical ring, no membrane. So nursing interventions are exposed bowel is covered loosely in a saline soaked pad and the abdomen is loosely wrapped in plastic. Pre-op, their NPO, IV fluids, and monitor for signs of infection. And post-op, most infants develop prolonged ileus and require mechanical ventilation and parental nutrition. Then we have an umbilical hernia. This is when the bowel protrudes through the opening in the abdomen wall. There's a few different types. So we have an inguinal hernia, which is painless swelling that is reducible. Incarcerated hernia, this is a medical emergency due to compromising blood supply requires surgical repair. Non-communicating hydrocele, this is residual peritoneal fluid is trapped and it usually resolves by one year old, one years old, and communicating hydrocele. So this is associated with a hernia and remains open from the scrotum to the abdominal cavity. Our nursing interventions include post-op for hernias, monitor vital signs, INOs, assess wounds, infections, redness, or drainage, and post-op for hydrocele or provide ice bags and scrotal support, instruct patients to avoid tub bathing until incision has healed, and avoid physical activity. And we have irritable bowel syndrome. So this is different than irritable bowel disease. Irritable bowel disease is an autoimmune condition which consists of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. We'll talk about that next. But before that, we'll talk about irritable bowel syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome is a self-limiting and will resolve due, it's due to increased motility. It's usually because of different foods that people eat that kind of upset their stomach. Signs and symptoms are diffuse abdominal pain unrelated to meals or activities, alternating constipation and diarrhea with the presence of undigested food and mucus, and nursing interventions are anticholinergic and moderate fiber, low fat, and a balanced diet. Inflammatory bowel disease. So this is not to be confused. So this is not irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. So this is not that, okay? These are two different things. IBS is like a food intolerance, more that situation. Inflammatory bowel disease is an autoimmune condition. So the body is fighting the intestinal tract. We have two types, ulcerative colitis and we have Crohn's. So ulcerative colitis is the chronic inflammation leading to poor absorption of nutrients. It begins in the rectum and spreads upward. The colon becomes edematous and has these bleeding lesions form on the mucous membranes. So scar tissue causes diminished absorption of nutrients. There'll be periods of exacerbations and remissions like any real autoimmune disease. So symptoms, anorexia, malice, frequent bloody diarrhea and mucus, abdominal pain, fever, fatigue, weight loss. The thing to know for ulcerative colitis is this is only affecting the very first lining of the mucous membrane of the intestine. So it's only affecting that outside lining and they get ulcers on this lining. And that's what's creating the blood in the mucus. So our nursing interventions in an acute phase, they may be NPO, need an IV or parenteal nutrition. We restrict their activity to reduce intestinal activity. We monitor stool color, consistency, and for any signs of blood, monitor for hemorrhaging, perforation, or peritonitis. They may be on a low fiber diet during an exacerbation. They wanna avoid alcohol, caffeine, raw fruits, raw vegetables, whole wheat, and milk. These patients may need surgery to create a stoma. The stoma should be pink. If it's purple or black in color, this indicates compromised circulation. When it comes to Crohn's, this inflammation can occur anywhere in the GI tract. 
for Crohn's, how we talked about with ulcerative colitis is just the outside line, lining. Crohn's can go all the way through. These ulcerations, it can create fistulas because it can be the entire membrane of the intestines. We can see it leads to thickening and scarring, a narrowed lumen, fistulas, ulcerations, and abscess. Again, remissions and exacerbations. We can see things like fever, cramping after meals, weight loss, dehydration, abdominal distension, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, anemia. And our nursing interventions are during acute episode, it's the same as ulcerative colitis. And again, surgery may be necessary, but is avoided as long as possible because recurrence of the disease in the same region is likely to occur. So now we're going to talk about eyes, ears, and throat disorders. So the first disorder is conjunctivitis. This is caused by an allergy, trauma, bacteria, or viral conjunctivitis. It's very contagious. Signs and symptoms are redness, edema, discharge, and burning. And our nursing interventions are hand hygiene, do not share towels, antibiotics or antiviral eye drops or ointment, no school or daycare until 24 hours after antibiotic administration, and avoid rubbing eyes, wearing contacts, or wearing eye makeup. Then we have otitis media. This is a common complication of a respiratory infection, common in children due to a shorter, wider, and straighter tubes. These are the tubes within their ears. I'm not actually sure how you say it, but this is a key thing. You could get a question about this. To prevent, we feed infant upright, breastfeed for the first six months, avoid smoking, and maintain immunizations. Signs and symptoms are fever, ear pain, and crying, no appetite, head rolling side to side or pulling on their ear, ear drainage, red and opaque tympatic membranes. When we look in their ear, the membrane that's in there is red. Nursing interventions, we want to encourage fluid intake, local hot or cold to help relieve discomfort, clean drainage from external ear with sterile swab and gauze, administer antibiotics, analgesics, in infants over six months, usually wait 72 hours before antibiotics to see if it will spontaneously resolve due to concerns about medication-resistant streptococcus pneumonia and screen for hearing loss. And in children three and under, we want to pull the pinna, so the top of the ear, back when giving meds. If they're older than three, we want to pull it up and back. So again, under three, we pull the pinna down and back. And if older than three, we pull it up and back. Then we have tonsillitis and adenoitis. So tonsillitis is the inflammation and infection of the tonsils. Adenoitis is the inflammation and infections of the adenoids. Signs and symptoms are recurrent sore throat, enlarged red tonsils that may be covered in white, difficulty swallowing, unpleasant breath, cough, and fever. Nursing interventions pre-op are to assess for signs of infection, bleeding, and clothing labs because throat is vascular. Oh, and clotting. Sorry, that's supposed to say and clotting labs. Okay. Assess for any loose teeth to decrease risk of aspiration during surgery and position prone or side lying to facilitate drainage and monitor for signs of bleeding and have suction equipment available. We also want to discourage coughing, blowing nose or cleaning throat, have antiemetics, clear, cool, non-citrus, non-carbonated fluids, avoid milk products, soft foods for one to two days, do not give the client straw, forks or sharp objects, and monitor pain, low grade fever and ear pain may last a few days. Then we have epistaxis. This is a nosebleed. We do not put the patient in a laying down position due to the risk of aspiration. We want to remain calm, keep the child calm and quiet, have them sit up, lean forward, apply continuous pressure to the nose with thumb and forefinger for at least 10 minutes. And if bleeding continues, insert cotton into each nostril, apply ice or a cold cloth to the bridge of the nose. So let's talk about the respiratory system in pediatric patients. So the first disorder we're going to talk about is epiglottitis. This is a bacterial form of croup. It's an inflammation of the epiglottis that occurs in children two to eight. 
It's an emergency situation due to the rapid progression to severe respiratory distress. Signs and symptoms we'll see are a high fever, red and inflamed throat, painful swallowing. There'll be no cough, but a muff muffled voice and drooling. They'll have agitation, tachypnea, retraction, struggling to breathe, and strider. You'll see tachycardia, and they'll be in a tripod position, again, because they're struggling to breathe. Our nursing interventions are patent airway, assess breath sounds, observe for any nasal flaring, retractions, or strider. Do not measure oral temperatures. They'll be NPO. Don't leave the child unattended. Avoid the supine position. Do not restrain the child. IV fluids, antibiotics, analgesics, corticosteroids, and antipyretics, cool mist, oxygen, and nebulized epinephrine. Have resurrection equipment available. Have resuscitation equipment available. Do not attempt to visualize the pharynx or take a throat culture as this can lead to a spasm and obstruct the airway. Then we have laryngotracheobronchitis. This is inflammation of the larynx, trachea, and bronchi. It's the most common type of group. Gradual onset preceded by upper respiratory infection. Nursing interventions are the same as epiglottitis. We also use a HELOX, which is a mixture of helium and oxygen which reduces the work of breathing and relieves airway obstruction. If the patient still has upper respiratory infection, we maintain them on isolation precautions. Next, we have bronchitis. This is inflammation of the trachea and the bronchi associated with upper respiratory infection, and it's usually mild. You'll see a fever, dry, hacking, non-productive cough that's worse at night and becomes productive in two to three days and will monitor for respiratory distress, provide cool, humidified air, and increased fluid intake. Then we have RSV. This is an acute viral infection that's highly contagious by direct contact with respiratory secretions. It's a common cause of respiratory infection and bronchiolitis. Bronchiolar swelling and increased mucus production. We'll see rhinorrhea, eye and ear drainage, pharyngitis, cough, wheezing fever, tachypnea, retraction, cyanosis, and apneic episodes. As RSV progresses, respiratory distress increases. Our nursing interventions are contact precautions, maintain patent airway with head of bed 30 to 40 degrees, elevated, cool humidified oxygen, monitor pulse ox, suction if needed, antiviral, antipyretic medications, and IV fluids for dehydration can also give them palizumab, which is for high-risk infants. And cough suppressants are given with caution because they interfere with clearing of secretions. Then we have pneumonia, and this is inflammation of the pulmonary perchema or alveoli or both. It's caused by virus, mucoplasma agent, bacteria, or aspiration. We'll see fever, cough, malice, rhinitis, sore throat, irritability, lethargy, poor feeding, headache, chills, abdominal pain, and chest pain. Our nursing interventions is to treat if symptomatic, administer oxygen with cool, humidified air, antipyritics, antibiotics, bacterial, if it's from bacterial. And we can also do chest physiotherapy or postural drainage and suction mucus. And we want to monitor for weight loss as this is a sign of dehydration. Then we have asthma. This is a chronic inflammatory disease of the airways. Signs and symptoms, which usually come on in the early morning or at night or both, is wheezing, dyspnea, chest tightness, non-productive cough, and it can have the production of a frothy, clear gel sputum pale or flushed or cyanosis. Nursing interventions are to assess the airway patency and respiratory status, oxygen by nasal cannula or face mask, quick release rescue medication and initiate an IV line, test for allergies and teach the family and patient how to administer inhalers and signs of an acute asthma attack. Then we have cystic fibrosis. This is an autosomal recessive trait with no cure. Secretions are thicker and stickier, causing obstructions in small passageways of the respiratory, GI, and reproductive systems. 
signs and symptoms are emphysema, hypoxemia, wheezing, cough, dyspnea, cyanosis, and a barrel chest. They may have muconium ileus, frothy stools, and a rectal prolapse, and pancreatic fibrosis. And they can have a high level of sodium and chloride in their sweat, which gives it a salty taste. Nursing interventions are to monitor respiratory status, chest PT, percussion, or postural drainage. A flutter mucus clearance device, which is a handheld and handheld percussors or special vest percussor. Use of a positive expiratory pressure mask may be used to move secretions to the upper airway. Aerolyzed or IV antibiotics, oxygen, high calorie, high protein, high fat diet, monitor stools, and pancreatic enzyme replacements within 30 minutes of eating and with all snacks and a salt replacement. Then we have sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS. This is most frequently occurs in the winter during sleep and in male infants from two to three years of age. Incidence is lower in breastfed infants. High risk for SIDS includes prone sleep position, a soft bed or excessive sheets in the bed, overheating, co-sleeping, and a mother who smoked or abused substances while pregnant or the child that is exposed to smoke. To prevent, the infant should be placed in the supine position to sleep and we should educate mothers on risk factors like smoking around the child. Let's talk about cardiovascular disorders in pediatric patients. So the first type we're gonna talk about is heart defects with increased pulmonary blood flow. So the first one is called an atrial septal defect. So this is an abnormal opening between the atria that causes increased flow of oxygenated blood to the right side of the heart right atrial and ventricular enlargement occurs. Signs and symptoms are signs of decreased cardiac output, so we'll see decreased peripheral pulses, feeding difficulties, irritability, restlessness, lethargy, tachycardia, oliguria, pale, cool extremities, and hypotension. Then we have atrioventricular canal defect. This results from the incomplete fusion of the endocardial cushions, and this is seen in Down syndrome. Signs and symptoms include a murmur, cyanosis with increases with crying, and signs of decreased cardiac output, which is the same as above, including decreased peripheral pulses, feeding difficulties, irritability, restlessness, lethargy, tachycardia, algeria, pale cool extremities, and hypotension. Then we have patent ductus arteriosus. So this is the shunt connecting the aorta and pulmonary artery does not close. Signs and symptoms are a murmur, a wide pulse pressure, and again, those signs of decreased cardiac output. Then we have ventricular septal defect. So this is an abnormal opening between the right and left ventricles, most close spontaneously during the first year of life, but people who have these, it has not closed. Signs and symptoms are murmur and signs of heart failure can be common. All right, now let's talk about obstructive defects. So the first type is aortic stenosis. So this is a narrowing of the aortic valve causing resistance to blood flow from the left ventricle to the aorta. Causes decreased cardiac output, left ventricular hypertrophy and pulmonary congestion. So signs and symptoms are a murmur, Signs of decreased cardiac output, including decreased peripheral pulses, feeding difficulties, irritability, restless lethargy, tachycardia, algeria, pale, cool extremities, and hypotension. They'll also have exercise intolerance, chest pain, and dizziness. Then we have coarctation of aorta. This is a localized narrowing near the ductus arteriosus. Signs and symptoms include the blood pressure is higher in the upper extremities than the lower. That's a key sign. And again, going through these and finding out the things that are specific to each one is really important because that's what they're going to give you in a question. You're going to see bounding pulses in arms, but weak femoral pulses and cool lower extremities. You may see signs of heart failure, decreased cardiac output, headaches, dizziness, epistaxis, fainting, from hypertension. Then you may see pulmonary stenosis. So this is narrowing at the entrance of the pulmonary artery that causes right ventricular 
hypertrophy and decreased pulmonary blood flow and the right ventricle may be hypoplastic. Signs and symptoms are murmur, if severe cyanosis at birth and decreased cardiac output where we see all those signs we went over before. Now let's talk about defects with decreased pulmonary blood flow. So the first one is tritology of Fallot. So this includes four deficits. We have ventricular septal deficit, pulmonary stenosis, overriding aorta, and a right ventricular hypertrophy. If pulmonary vascular resistance is higher than systemic resistance, the shunt is from right to left. If systemic resistance is higher than pulmonary resistance, the shunt is from left to just. Signs and symptoms are cyanosis at birth, a murmur, episodes of hypoxia and cyanosis, we call these TET spells. The child may squat during these episodes, which helps to increase the return of blood to the heart. They may have clubbing of their fingers and they may have poor growth. Our nursing interventions for a TET spell is to place the child in a knee chest position, administer 100% oxygen, administer morphine sulfate, and administer fluids IV. Then we have tricuspid atresia. So this is when the tricuspid valve fails to develop. There's no communication from the right atrium and right ventricle, so blood will flow through. Blood flows through an ASD or patent formant oval to the left side of the heart. Blood flows through a VSD to the right ventricle and out to the lungs, usually associated with pulmonic stenosis, and it mixes oxygenated and unoxygenated blood. So signs and symptoms are cyanosis, tachycardia, shortness of breath, and clubbing. Then we have mixed deficits. So the first one is hypoplastic left heart syndrome. This is an undeveloped left side of the brain. Signs and symptoms include mild cyanosis, signs of heart failure, fatal in the first few months of life without intervention. Then we have total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. This is failure of the pulmonary veins to join the left atrium. It mixed blood is returned to the right atrium and shunted from right to left atrium through the ASD. Signs and symptoms are right side of heart hypertrophies, signs of heart failure, and cyanosis. Then we have trunctus arteriosus, so this is failure of a normal separation of the pulmonary artery and the aorta, blood from both the ventric ventricles mix, signs and symptoms are murmur, hypoxemia, and cyanosis, moderate to severe heart failure, and poor growth. Then we have transposition of the great arteries, so this is pulmonary artery leaves the left ventricle and the aorta leaves the right ventricle. There's no communication between systemic and pulmonary circulation. We'll see severe cyanosis at birth and cardiomegaly. So our nursing interventions for cardiovascular defects include monitoring vital signs, respiratory status, and lung sounds, signs of heart failure such as periorbital edema or dependent edema, fluid restriction if needed, monitor INOs, daily weights, high calorie nutrition, and if respiratory distress occurs, place the child in reverse Trendelenburg position, elevating the head and upper body to decrease the work of breathing. Nursing interventions for a hypercyanotic tet spell. So place the infant in that needed chest position, administer 100% O2, administer morphine sulfate, and administer fluids IV. Pediatric inflammatory disorders. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is rheumatic fever. So this is an inflammatory autoimmune disease affecting connective tissue of the heart, joints, skin, blood vessels, and central nervous system. The most serious complication is rheumatic heart disease. This Rheumatic fever occurs two to six weeks after untreated streptococcal infection of the upper respiratory tract. Signs and symptoms are chorea, which is involuntary movements of extremities and face, fever, carditis, inflammation of the mitral valve, elevated ESR, C-reactive protein, which is often seen in autoimmune diseases. They may have abdominal pain, erythema, mar genitatum, which are red lesions on the trunk, 
ashoff bodies, which are lesions found in the heart, blood vessels, brain, and joints, subcutaneous nodules, and polyarthritis. Our nursing interventions are to ask about a recent sore throat because we know that this occurs two to six weeks after that streptococcal infection, assess vital signs, bed rest, and limit physical activity, antibiotics, analgesics, anti-inflammatories, seizure precautions if the patient has chorea, which again, those are involuntary movements of the extremities and face. Next, we're going to talk about Kawasaki disease. So this is an acute systemic inflammatory illness. Most serious complication is an aneurysm. Signs and symptoms depends on the stage. So first we have the acute stage. This we're going to see fever, red throat, conjunctal hyper Uremia, swollen hands with red and enlargement of the cervical lymph nodes. Then the subacute stage will start to see cracked lips, peeling of the skin on fingers and toes, joint pain, cardiac manifestations, and thrombocytosis. Then the convalescent stage is when the child will then appear normal. And Our nursing interventions for Kawasaki disease are to monitor for fever, assess heart sounds, rate and rhythm, assess for edema, redness, and peeling of the skin, soft food diet, range of motion exercises, and aspirin. Then we have juvenile idiopathic arthritis. This, again, is an autoimmune inflammatory disease affecting the joints and other tissues, Our nursing interventions are range of motion exercises, medication, and holistic pain relief. Renal and urinary disorders. So the first disorder we're going to talk about is glomerulonephritis. So this is a kidney disorder characterized by inflammatory injury to the glomerus caused by immunologic reduction or autoimmune disease. This can lead to kidney failure, hypertension, encephalopathy, pulmonary edema, or heart failure. Signs and symptoms. These are important to know. So periorbital or facial edema that is more prominent in the morning. So that again is a very specific sign. Anorexia, decreased urine output, cloudy, smoky, brown colored urine. This is another key sign. Pallor, irritability, lethargy, older children may have abdominal pain, flank pain or headaches, hypertension, proteinuria, or foam in the urine. So again, another key sign. Our nursing interventions are going to be to assess for the airway, patency, vital signs, and weight, assess for bounding, increased pulse or distended hand hand and neck veins, assess for elevated central venous pressure and dysrhythmias, limit activity, administer diuretics, initiate seizure precautions, and remember that they are at risk for fluid volume overload and usually have peripheral or periorbital edema in the acute. Now let's talk about Nephrotic syndrome. So this is a kidney disorder characterized by proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, and edema. Signs and symptoms are weight gain, leg or ankle edema, and ascites, periorbital or facial edema that is more prominent in the morning, low urine output, urine is dark and frothy, blood pressure, normal or slightly decreased, lethargy, anorexia, or pallor, And our nursing interventions are to monitor vital signs, weights, intakes, and outputs, monitor urine-specific gravity and protein, monitor for edema, and corticosteroid therapy or immunosuppressant therapy, diuretics, and plasma expanders. Then we have hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is a bacterial toxin, chemical, or virus that causes an acute kidney injury in children six months to five years. Signs and symptoms are hemolytic anemia, the triad of anemia, thrombocytopenia, and kidney injury, proteinuria, hematuria, urinary casks, elevated BUN, nitrogen, serum creatinine, and decreased hematocrit and hemoglobin. And our nursing interventions are dialysis, fluid balance, and adequate nutrition. Then we have enuresis. So this is the 
patient is unable to control their bladder function even though they have reached an age that they should, which is usually five. Nursing interventions are your analysis and culture, make sure they don't have an infection going on, limit fluid intake at night, initiate a reward system, and have children involved in the cleanup. Then we have crypto or cheatism, which is a condition in which one or both testes fail to descend into the sacral sac. Nursing interventions after the age of one medical or surgical treatment may be initiated, and older children may be prescribed HCG. So this is HCG. This is supposed to be human. So HCG stimulates testosterone. Then we have epispatis and hyposapiodes. So these are congenital defects involving abnormal placement of the urethra within the male genitalia. There are different types. So the first one, epispatis, is the dorsal urethra opening, and hyposapiodes is the ventral urethra opening, which can lead to bacteria entering into the urine. Surgery is usually done before the age of toilet training, which is 16 to 18 months, circumcision may not be performed due to keeping the skin for surgical reconstruction. Nursing interventions post-op is they may have a pressure dressing. We want to monitor vital signs, encourage fluids, and monitor INOs, provide pain meds and anticholinergics for bladder spasms, and administer antibiotics. Then we have bladder which is a congenital abnormality characterized by extrusion of the urinary bladder to the outside of the body. Nursing interventions are to monitor output and the signs of infection or renal function, maintain integrity of the exposed bladder, prevent bladder tissue from drying while allowing for drainage of the urine. So we want to cover the exposed bladder with a sterile dressing, administer antibiotics. And applying petroleum jelly to the bladder mucosa is avoided because it tends to dry out, adhere to the bladder mucosa, and damage the delicate tissue when the dressing is removed. Pediatric neurological disorders. So the first one is cerebral palsy. This is an impaired movement and posture related to an abnormality in the extrapyramidal or pyramidal motor system. Signs and symptoms are irritability and crying, difficulty feeding, stiff and rigid muscle tone, persistent of, persistence of infant reflexes, so that moro or tonic neck will continue after six months when it should be gone after three or four. They'll have delayed milestones, abnormal posture, and even seizures. Our nursing interventions are PT, OT, and speech therapy, assess developmental age, they may need mobilizing devices, ensuring a safe environment with seizure precautions, and making sure to keep them upright after meals. Then we have head injury. So there are two types. So we have an open head injury. This is a fracture or penetration of the skull. And a closed head injury. This is a blunt trauma. So this is like someone gets hit really hard and they have a bleed inside their brain, but it's not open. You can't see inside. If it was open where there's a fracture or like a hole in their skull, that would be an open head fracture. So closed, there's no opening, but we need to watch for intracranial pressure, right? Because if they have a brain bleed, the pressure inside their head is going to Signs and symptoms, so again, depends on the stage. So early signs, we're gonna see a change in level of consciousness is the earliest indicator of improvement or deterioration. Slight changes in vital signs can be seen. In an infant, they might be irritable with a high-pitched cry. Their, their fontanelles will be bulging. They'll have increased head circumference. You may see a McCuin sign, which is a cracked pot sound on the head. They might have a setting sun sign, which the sclerula in their eyes shows above the iris. They might have a dilated scalp veins. And in a child, you may see headache, nausea, vomiting, visual disturbances, and seizures. Late signs include significant decrease in level of consciousness or coma, decorticate flexion or deseverate extension posture, and shine strokes respirations. Our nursing interventions are to immobilize the neck and spine after a head injury if spinal injury is suspected. Make sure they have a patent airway, giving them oxygen, 
Head and body should maintain midline, a calm, quiet environment with seizure precautions and keep them NPO. Watch for decreased responsiveness. Monitor for nose and ear drainage. We're looking for blood or clear fluid, which would indicate real spinal fluid. Monitor for an epidural hematoma, so one dilated, non-reactive pupil. And drainage from the nose and ear needs to be tested for the presence of glucose. If positive for glucose, this indicates the leakage of cerebral spinal. And then we have a brainstem injury. So signs and symptoms are deep and rapid respirations, bradycardia, wide pulse pressure, dilated and unequal pupils. So next we have hydrocephalus. So this is increased cerebral spinal fluid due to a tumor, hemorrhage, infection, or trauma, and it leads to head enlargement. Signs and symptoms in an infant are increased head circumference, McEwen sign, dilated scalp veins, setting sun eyes, bulging interior fontanelles, and in a child you'll see behavior changes, headaches on awakening, nausea, vomiting, ataxia, and nystagmus. Nursing interventions are surgical interventions of ventri Culoperitoneal, so cerebral spinal fluid accumulating shunt to the peritoneal cavity. So this is the shunt going from the head down to the stomach area or to the right atrium of the heart. Pre-op, we're monitoring eyes and nose, small frequent feedings, and then pre-op NPO. Post-op, we monitor vital signs and neuroscience, keep the child flat, monitor for signs of intracranial pressure. If this occurs, elevate the head of the bed 15 to 30 degrees, monitor head circumference, and monitor for infection, eyes, and O's. Then we have meningitis. This is an infection of the central nervous system. Signs and symptoms we'll see are fever, chills, headache, vomiting, diarrhea, poor feeding, or anorexia, nuchal rigidity, poor or a high shrill cry, altered level of consciousness, bulging fontanelles in the infant. You'll also see a positive Koenig sign, which is the inability to extend legs when thigh is flexed anteriorly at the hip, or a Brzezinski sign, which is neck, neck flexion caused, causes adduction and flexion movements of the lower extremities. We'll see muscle or joint pain, ear drainage or petechiae or pupuric rashes. Our nursing interventions are to have respiratory isolation precautions for at least 24 hours after antibiotics are initiated, neuro and level of consciousness assessment, monitor for seizures and hearing loss, and assessing nutritional status in I's and O's. Then we have ADHD. This is a behavioral disorder characterized by inattention, overactivity, and impulsivity. These patients are easily distracted, fidgety, and have a poor attention span. Our nursing interventions are to provide the patient with information on medication, therapy, and school, and medication may be prescribed. Watch for possible weight loss, nervousness, tics, or insomnia. Then we have autism. This is a complex neurodevelopmental disorder that can range on a spectrum from mild to severe. Signs and symptoms are impaired social interaction, so lack of social play, lack of seeking comfort, impaired peer relationships, verbal impairment, so monotone speech, echilala, lack of imaginary play, intellectual deficit, altered behavior, so attachment to objects, self-injury, repetitive routines, or body movements. And nursing interventions are to determine the child's routines, habits, preferences, and how they like to communicate and the safe in, a safe environment is the priority. Then we have Ray's syndrome. So this is an acute encephalopathy that follows a viral illness or the administration of aspirin. Signs and symptoms are a viral illness four to seven days before the onset of symptoms, fever, nausea, and vomiting, and neurological deterioration and increased blood ammonia levels. Nursing interventions are to provide rest and decrease stimulation in the environment and assess neuro status. Then we have neural tube defects. So these neural tubes fail to close that lead to a central nervous system deficit. They'll have sensory motor deficit, dislocated hips, club foot, or hydrocephalus. So there's a couple different types. So first we have spina bifida oculata, which the spine fails to close in the lumbosacral area. 
The spinal cord is intact and usually not visible. Meninges are not exposed and neurological deficits usually are not present. Then we have spina bifida cystica, which protrusion of the spinal cord, meninges are both. Defect causes failure to close of the vertebrae and neural tube, leading to a sac-like protrusion in the lumbar area or sacral area. Then we have a meningia seal, which is a protrusion, involves the meninges and a sac-like cyst that contains cerebral spinal fluid in the midline of the back. Neurological deficits usually are not present. Then we have a myelo meningia seal, which is a protrusion of the meninges, Cerebral spinal fluid, neural roots, and part of the spinal cord. The sac is covered by a thin membrane but is prone to rupture, and neuro deficits are evident. So signs and symptoms depends on the type and the spinal cord deficit. Flaccid paralysis of the legs, altered bladder and bowel function, hip and joint deformities, and hydrocephalus. Nursing interventions are to evaluate the sac and measure the lesion, perform a neuro assessment, monitor for intracranial pressure, measure head circumference and assess for bulging fontanelles, protect the exposed sac, cover with a sterile moist dressing, change the sac dressing regularly, aseptic technique and monitor for infection, assess for drainage, place the patient in the prone position and turn the head to the side for feedings and prep for surgery. Like Pediatric musculoskeletal disorders. So the first one is developmental dysplasia of the hips. This is an abnormal development of the hip, head of the femur, which is not in the proper place. So signs and symptoms for the neonate is shortening of the limb on the affected side, restricted abduction of the hip on the affected side, so limited range of motion, unequal of the gluteal and thigh folds. They'll have a positive ortholantic click, so this is when the examiner abducts the thighs, applies gentle pressure forward over the gen greater trochanter and a clicking sensation indicates dislocating the femoral head and moving into the vestibulum. Then they'll also have a positive Barlow's test where the examiner adducts the hips and applies pressure down and the back with the thumbs and can feel the femoral head move out of the vestibulum. So nursing interventions depend on the age. So birth to six months, they'll be splinting of the hips with a pavlic harness continuously to maintain flexion, abduction, and external rotation, worn continuously for three to six months. Then at six to 18 months, there'll be a gradual reduction by traction if necessary, a hip spike cast for two to four months, then flexion abduction is applied for three months, and the older child may need an operative reduction in reconstitution. Then we have deformities, and there are some different ones. So we have a congenital club foot. This is a deformity of the ankle and foot. Our nursing interventions are manipulation and casting performed weekly until eight to 12 weeks of age, and they may need surgery. Then we have idiopathic scoliosis. So this is a spinal deformity that involves lateral curvature or spinal rotation. Nursing interventions are diagnosed during pre-adolescent growth spurt, asymmetry of the ribs and hips when the child bends forward, which is called the Adams test, and monitor progression, they may need surgery or a brace. Then we have Marfran syndrome. So this is a disorder of connective tissue that affects the skeletal, cardiac, eyes, and skin systems. These patients' bodies will be tall and thin, and they'll usually have vision and cardiac problems. So we wanna monitor for vision problems and curvature of the spine. They may need cardiac meds and instruct the patients that the child should not play competitive or athletics or contact sports. Then we have leg calf parethes disease, which is a condition that affects the hip joint where the femur and pelvis meet. Blood supply is interrupted and the femoral head begins to die. We'll start to see patients with limping, pain, and stillness in the hip, groin, thigh, or knees with limited range of motion. They'll need for nursing interventions, PT using crutches, casting, nighttime brace, and surgery may be needed. Infectious disease. So the first one is the measles. So the incubation period is 10 to 20 days. The communicable period is four days before the rash to five days after the rash appears. 
The spread is by respiratory secretions, blood, and infected urine, so airborne and direct contact precautions. Signs and symptoms are fever, weakness, malice. The three C's, corsia, cough, conjunctivitis. They will have a rash on their face that turns the gradually spreads down to the feet, red to brown over time. They'll have copalix spots, which are small red spots with a bluish white center and a red base located on the buccal mucosa, and last three days. Nursing interventions, so airborne droplet and contact precautions, quiet activities and bed rest, cool mist for cough and clusa, and antipyretics and vitamin A. Then we have roseola. This is a type of herpes virus. The incubation period is 5 to 15 days. The communicable period source and transmission is unknown. Signs and symptoms are a sudden high fever greater than 102 for 3 to 5 days and a rash that appears several hours to 2 days after the fever. Our nursing interventions are supportive interventions. Then we have rubella or German measles. This incubation period is 14 to 21 days with a communicable period of 7 days before and 5 days after the rash. It is spread by nasopharyngeal secretions, blood, stool, and urine, so this will be droplet and direct precautions and contact. Signs and symptoms are fever, weakness, pink, red, maculopapular rash over the entire body, petechiae on the soft palate. Nursing interventions are that airborne droplet and contact precautions and keep away from pregnant women. Then we have varicella or chickenpox. The incubation period is 13 to 17 days with a communicable period of one to two days before the rash to six days after the vesicles have formed and crusts have formed. Spread by respiratory secretions and direct contact with skin lesions, so droplet airborne and contact precautions. Signs and symptoms are fever, weakness, anorexia, a macular rash which first appears on trunk lesions and becomes pustules and they begin to dry and then crust. Nursing interventions are strict airborne droplet and contact precautions. We may use a cyclovir or the varicella immunoglobulin or intravenous immunoglobulin for those who are immunocompromised. Then we have mumps. So this incubation period is 14 to 21 days with a communicable period immediately before and after paratoid gland swelling spread by saliva or urine, so airborne contact and droplet precautions. Signs and symptoms are fever, headache, malice, anorexia, jaw or ear pain, followed by a paratoid gland swelling. This is the key thing that is on like the side of your face. Pain increases when chewing. Orchitis or acute meningitis may occur. Nursing interventions are airborne droplet contact precautions, bed rest until paratoid gland swelling subsides, avoid foods that require chewing, hot and cold compresses. Then we have pertussis, also known as whooping cough. This incubation period is 5 to 21 days with a communicable period when discharge from the respiratory secretion occurs. Spread by respiratory secretion, so droplet airborne contact precautions. Signs and symptoms are a cough with a whooping inspiration, cyanosis, respiratory distress, listlessness, irritability, anorexia. Nursing interventions are airborne droplet contact precautions, antimicrobials, reduce irritants and environmental factors that increase coughing, suction and humidified oxygen if needed, and infants don't receive maternal immunity to pertussis, so they are at risk before they are vaccinated. Diphtheria has an incubation period of two to five days. A communicable period is variable until three negative cultures of discharge from the nose, skin, or lesions spread by direct contact with an infected person, carrier, or contaminated articles. Signs and symptoms are a low-grade fever, malice and sore throat, foul smelling, mucopurulent nasal drainage, dense pseudomembrane formation in the throat that may interfere with eating, drinking, and breathing, lymph adenitis, neck edema, or a bowl neck. That's a key thing. 
Nursing interventions ensure strict isolation, administer diphtheria antitoxin after sensitivity has been ruled out in antibiotics, provide suction, humidified oxygen, and tracheostomy care if needed. Then we have poliomyelitis. So incubation period, 7 to 14 days. Communicable period is unknown. The virus was present in the throat one week after infection and in feces four to six weeks after. Signs and symptoms are fever, malice, anorexia, nausea, headache, sore throat, abdominal pain, soreness, and stiffness in the trunk, neck, and limbs, which progress to paralysis. Nursing interventions are enteric and contact precautions, supportive treatment, bed rest, monitor for respiratory paralysis, and physical therapy. Next, we have scarlet fever. So this incubation period is one to seven days with a communicable period of 10 days, but can last for months. It is secreted in the nasopharyngeal secretion, so contact and droplet precautions. Signs and symptoms are high fever, flesh treaks, vomiting, headache, and large lymph nodes in the neck, abdominal pain, a red, fine, sandpaper-like rash on the axilla, groin, and neck that blanches with pressure, Desquamous sheet like slothing of the skin on the palms and soles that appear by one to three weeks. Tongue is coated white furry covering with red papillae, which is known as white strawberry tongue. Tonsils are red, edemus, and covered with exudate. Pharynx is edemus and beefy red. Our nursing interventions are contact precautions and respiratory precautions until 24 hours after antibiotics and supportive therapy, bed rest, and encouraged fluids. Then we have erythema infectisonium or Fitz disease. This incubation period is four to 14 days, but up to 20. And the communicable period is unknown. Before the rash, people will be asymptomatic or a mild fever with malice, headache, and running nose. Then stages of the rash will be erythema of the face that develops and disappears after one to four days. Then one day after the rash appears symmetry symmetrically on all extremities. Our nursing interventions are to avoid pregnant women in supportive care, antipyretics, analgesics, and anti-inflammatory medications. Then we have mono. Incubation period is four to six weeks. Communicable period is unknown. Signs and symptoms are fever, malice, headache, fatigue, nausea, abdominal pain, sore throat, and enlarged red tonsils. Edemopathy and heptosplenomegaly. Discrete macular rash over the trunk may occur, and they're going to need supportive care and monitor for splenic rupture, which will be abdominal pain in the left upper quadrant and left shoulder. Then we have Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This has an incubation period of two to 14 days. It comes from a tick. Signs and symptoms are fever, malice, anorexia, vomiting, headache, malaysia, a maculopapular or petechiae rash on the extremities, palms, and soles, but can spread to other areas, and they'll need supportive care and antibiotics. So for pediatrics, let's talk about immunizations. So precautions, they are contraindicated if a patient has had an anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine or its components previously. There are live virus vaccines which are not administered to immunocompromised patients, individuals with a sensitivity to gelatin, or pregnant women. So this is a chart of the recommended childhood immunizations. So at one month, they'll get a hepatitis B. At two months, they'll get an inactive polio, a diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, or a DTaP. They'll get an influenza type B, pneumococcal, and rhodiovirus. Then at four months, they'll again get that inactivated polio, the Tdap, the influenza type B, this pneumococcal, and the rhodiovirus. So again, these are all the same as the two month. At six months, they will again get the inactivated polio, Tdap, influenza type B, pneumococcal, rhodiovirus, and again, the hep B. So this is the same one that they get at one month. So they get, again, all the same as the two and four, but then adding on that one month. Then 12 to 15 months, they'll get a influenza type B, a pneumococcal, an MMR, a hep A, and a varicella vaccine. 
Then at 15 to 18 months, look at a Tdap. At 18 to 33 months, look at another Hep A. At four to six years, they will get an inactivated polio, a Tdap, an MMR, and a varicella. And then at 11 to 12 years, they'll get an MMR if not given at four to six years, an adolescent Tdap, a meningococcal, and an HPV. It's important to note that normal reactions to a vaccine are tenderness, redness, swelling, low-grade fever, drowsiness, and decreased appetite. If you would like a copy of the study guide, you can find it on my website, blossomwithjessica.com.